Hi, hello. I'm Lauren Wilcox from the University of Cambridge Center for Gender Studies, and I am very pleased to welcome you all here um, today for our panel um, on gendered and sexual politics of authoritarianism, which is part of the Query Authoritarianisms Conference. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you to Crash and to LGBTQ Plus at Cambridge as well. And thank you to the organizers, Marchen and Haken. Um, also. So in this panel today, the gender and sexual politics of authoritarianisms, we aim to discuss various ways in which gender and sexuality inform different kinds of authoritarian politics, from knowledge production about gender to legal interventions to disrupting state enforced ways of thinking. This panel uh, aims at expanding our understanding of gender and sexuality in the context of authoritarianisms. So I'm going to start off by introducing our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is uh, is Judith Tak Takac um, from the Hungarian Academy of Sciences, and her talk is on institutionalizing gender phobia and Hungary. Um, thank you, Judith. Well, thank you very much. I'm very um, happy that I I could join you today, and thanks for inviting me. So, um, my preparing for this presentation, I realized that there were so many issues uh, to talk about under the heading gender and sexual um, politics of authoritarianisms. Luckily, here and now, I do not have to engage in detailed discussions of what we call, but what we can call paradoxical right-wing sexual politics, since together with Cornelia Mercer and Jennifer Rammel, we have just prepared a book manuscript focusing on how it was possible to mainstream hateful and anti-democratic ideologies in many European societies and what kind of paradoxical roles uh, sexual politics have played in this process. Today, I will focus on gender phobia, defined here as a concept describing the strategic avoidance of breaking gender norms in institutional settings and everyday life. Gender phobia can be institutionalized, for instance, in the form of banning gender studies from higher educational curricula and often internalized. It can obviously affect trans people if they are framed as threatening the heteronormative binary gender system by their mere existence, but obviously it can threaten not only them, but many others as well. I argue that gender phobia became um, a fundamental feature of the expanding far-right agenda that has been playing out in practice since the system of national um, cooperation uh, was established by the newly elected Hungarian government in 2010. Trans communities in Hungary and elsewhere are increasingly faced with the organized resistance against gender equality and intimate citizenship by anti-gender movements attacking the straw man of gender ideology, a multifunction enemy that can be shaped in different ways to fit into a political protest to protect allegedly endangered traditional family values. Social homogeneity is not just a historical notion, but will also be important in the future because it gives people security claimed the Hungarian um, Minister of Human Capacities at the German conference, which was about what does conservatism mean today in uh, 2018. In the minister's speech, uh, criticizing the overly globalist German conservative approach, social homogeneity was interpreted in a racialized way as a counterpoint to migration, bringing on a catastrophe that would change our country's image and coexistence, the culture on which Hungary and Europe has been built for a thousand years. As this episode illustrates in the political discourse used by representatives of the Hungarian government, Hungarianness should be preserved in an imagined intact form in order to prevent the threat, not only by unwanted social heterogeneity caused by migration, but also by running out of Hungarians. That is the 18th century Herderian prophecy on the disappearance of the Hungarian nation coming true. 
Another fitting rhetorical pattern often used by the Hungarian right-wing ruling parties is about the freedom fight against external pressure of a worldwide conspiracy supported by domestic liberals trying to stop Hungarians acting in their own ways um, and resisting the danger of becoming colonized. In present-day Hungarian um, in present-day Hungary, social homogeneity is to be achieved by demography-focused governments, that is a demographically motivated approach to family policy that keeps revolving around increasing the Hungarian birth rate. Two days after the Hungarian national elections of 2018, bringing the third consecutive two-thirds majority victory for Prime Minister Orban, the government, the government spokesperson declared that demography is the single most important Hungarian national strategy issue. In fact, reference to demographic decrease as the most important challenge facing the nation was a recurrent theme already in the previous term when fr family-friendly politics was declared, implementing family mainstreaming rather than gender mainstreaming, as if these were completely incompatible concepts. The anti-gender discourse could also be nicely tagged into the freedom fighter rhetoric, where Hungarians should be free to preserve our traditions reflecting the natural order and resisting the unnatural gender craze. During the second decade of the 21st century, Orban's right-wing populist government had successfully created an increasingly xenophobic and gender unequal sexist social climate where academic freedom was threatened, gender studies programs were banned, and anti gender campaigns were elevated to the level of state policy. While the populist governance techniques are easily ident identifiable, the policy reforms introduced by the Orban regime can be characterized by ideological diversity, including neoliberal, conservative, and atheist approaches. However, the preoccupation with an imagined traditional family model and uh, the vigorous promotion of Christian national values as the real Hungarian ones reveal a specific form of crossbred conservatism that can be closely linked to Wendy Brown's description, which you can see on the screen. Neoliberals who are also conservatives are inclined to ontologize the individual, the heterosexual nuclear family and sexual difference. They seek to root each in nature rather than in power and do not want the family held responsible for gendering individuals or generating social inequalities. This expanding far-right agenda has been playing out in practice since the system of national cooperation was established in 2010 with work, home, family, health, and order declared as its main pillars. Reading it together with the marriage defense provision of the new uh, fundamental law replacing the old Hungarian constitution, stating that Hungary shall protect the institution of marriage as the union of a man and a woman, established by voluntary decision and the family as the basis of the nation's survival. The new framework obviously created a step back from the previous constitutional regime. Now, instrumentalizing LGBTQ rights for political gain became a political strategy, especially during the last one and a half, two years, with a weird acceleration during the COVID pandemic, when con uh, contentious state of emergency laws enabled the government's ruling by decree. In May 2020, an unalterable sex at birth record was introduced in the civil registry, proposed immediately after having declared the state of emergency to fight the coronavirus in March uh, 2020. In September, the book Wonderland is for Everyone, uh, published by the Labris Lesbian Association, has sparked a public debate as 
for example, the writers reported a, pol and a politician from the far-right fringe, our homeland party tore the book apart and shredded it at a press conference and called it homosexual propaganda. This led to a legal case when the authority responsible for consumer protection ordered that every book should have a special sign uh, si signaling that it has LGBTQ content. Similar decision was introduced against Coca-Cola previously. The firm was fined for featuring a same-sex couple in an advertisement. <clears throat> so we can say that there is now a de facto propaganda law functioning in Hungary, similar to Russia, which we will hear a bit later, uh, uh, in the name of protecting children. Last November, constitutional amendments introduced the tax and the text says the mother is a woman, the father is a man. No one really knows what, how this should be interpreted, but it has probably something to do with traditional family values. They also add in another piece of text, it says Hungary protects children's rights to their identity in line with their birth sex and their right to education according to our country's constitutional identity and system of values based on Christian culture. So schools now have a duty to make sure that children are raised according to their birth sex. And this forces educational institutions as well as parents to educate children in a conservative Christian way. Uh, this was followed by the uh, so-called adoption ban, which entered into force just a few weeks ago, actually on the 1st of March which according to which only married couples uh, can adopt jointly and a special permission can be granted for individual adoptive parents by the minister responsible for family appear for family affairs who is uh, well most probably a very kind of renaissance person who knows about everything much better than professionals so this way a politician can decide who is a suitable parent these examples can highlight the fact that present-day mainstream Hungarian political discourse is hostile towards public displays of, is of issues related to sexual and gender diversity, which is embedded, I argue, in <clears throat> gender phobia. Orban's reading role in conservative family movements across the region is closely linked to radical repatriarchization and this hegemonic restructuring as Tops and Landway Benton argue rests on the issues of gender politics and anti-discrimination seen by conservative national elites as alien European Union inspired programs imposed on nation states against the will of their citizens and politicians whether these concern gender mainstreaming, LGBT rights or reproductive rights. I would like to show you um, um, a short video, which is um, uh, which is part of a campaign which, um, called "Family is Family," and this was the um, uh, this can be seen as an act of resisting the um, uh, the present day Hungarian um, official discourse. Ki a csaj, és ki a fiú? Anyák napján mit fogtok mondani a gyereknek? Mi mindketten fiúk vagyunk, mind a ketten apukák vagyunk. Természetesen mind a ketten az édesanyjai vagyunk ennek a gyereknek. Már több anyák napját megéltünk, beszélgetünk a vérszerinti anyukájáról, aki, akiről van képünk, aki az életet adta neki, aki nagyon fontos szereplő ilyen módon az életében. Úgy. Mindenki minden szerepben van, én azt gondolom, és mindig a legjobbat akarjuk a Andrisnak, a kisfiúnak. Nem. Nem tudom. Egy ilyen gyerekkel mennyire lesz kivételezve? Gondolom, folyamatosan figyelni kell rá, 
és ez nem fel a többi gyerekkel szemben. Miért gondoljuk azt, hogy egy szivárvány családban felnővő gyereknek több személyes figyelemre van szüksége? Ő neki a társai figyelmére, a belük való egyenlő bánásmódra van szüksége, nem megkülönböztetésre. Nem a szivárvány család határozza meg a gyerek viselkedését az intézményben, hanem a családi körülmények, és hogyha valaki zaklatott családi körülmények közül jön, akkor igényelni fog több figyelmet. A család egy férfi, egy nő és gyerekek közössége. A Bibliában is ez van, a pokorra fogtok jutni mind. <gül> Hát ez durva, mert hogy én, én hívő vagyok, és gyakorlom a hitem, a kisfiam hit arra jár. Azt hiszem, hogy ez a Bibliában szintén megtalálható, hogy ne ítélj, hogy ne ítéltes. És hogy ez nagyon fontos nekem, hogy, hogy ő, ő is kapjon ebből az értékvilágból, amiben én benne vagyok, és akkor nehezen fog kapni, hogyha azt hallja, hogy te egy olyan kapcsolatban vagy, ami, ami az Isten szemében nagyon rossz. Az, hogy keresztényként az emberek esetleg azt gondolják, hogy a homofóbia az egy előírás, azt, azt gondolom, hogy tévedés. Az a gyerek, akit buzik vagy leszbik nevelnek, biztosan sérült lesz. Egy ilyen elfosorált családban nevelkedő gyereknek soha nem lesz egészséges családképe. Szóval nekem alapvetően gondom van azzal, hogyha egészséges családképről beszélünk, mert nem nagyon tudom megfejteni, hogy ez pontosan mit jelent. Nem azon fog múlni, hogy a szülei melegek -e, vagy sem, hanem azon, hogy szeretettel és kapcsolatban elfogadják -e őt. Nagyon ö, sok empirikus bizonyítékunk van arra, hogy a, a szülőség az a, az a törődésen alapul. Tehát, hogyha egészséges családképről beszélünk, akkor azt gondolom, hogy azt kell megtanulni a gyereknek, hogy hogy ki törődik vele, és hogy ki az, akire számíthat. Miért kell állandóan reklámozni, hogy buzik vagytok? Sokkal kevesebben utálnának, ha nem pattognátok. Semmi bajom a melegekkel, ha a négy fal között csinálják. Semmi bajom a homofóbokkal, ha a négy fal között csinálják. Én azt gondolom, hogy, hogy négy fal között nem lehet valakit szeretni. Nem érzem azt, hogy reklámozzuk, azt érzem, hogy próbálunk emberek maradni ebben az egész szarban, amit amit kavarnak. Azért, mert mi egymást szeretjük, és nem másik két nőt, ugyanazokat a dolgokat szeretnénk csinálni, és nem hiszem, hogy ez bárkit meg kéne megbotránkoztassa. Mi befogadunk, hogy a gyerek is buzi lesz, ha buzik nevelik? Nem érdemes ebben fogadni, mert nincsen olyan megbízható kutatás, amelyik ezt alátámasztaná. Viszont amit, a, amit mindenképpen a kutatások mutatnak, az az, hogy a melegek által és a leszbikusok által nevelt gyerekek nyitottabbak lesznek, tehát toleránsabbak lesznek egy csomó dologgal kapcsolatban. Miről beszéltek, milyen jogaitok nincsenek, meg miért akartok több jogot? Mint ami másoknak van. Hú. Ha nem is tudom, hogy hova kezdjük, hogy milyen jogaink nincsenek meg, uh, inkább beszéljünk arról, hogy a gyerekünknek milyen jogai nincsenek meg. Én azt szeretném, hogy csak azért, mert melegnek születtem, azért ne, ne kelljen elhagynom ezt az országot, ahol az összes barátom van, a rokonaim. Amikor mondjuk azt kérdezik, hogy mi az anyja neve, uh, akkor egy fiktív anyanév lesz ott mondjuk az ő esetében, és nem lehet ott az Ádámnak a neve, mint egy szülő mint egy másik szülőnek. Én azt szeretném, hogy a kisfiamnak ugyanolyan könnyű legyen, mint másnak, hogy a, hogy a kisfiam helyzete ne legyen negatív azért, mert én mondjuk egyedülálló férfiként nevelem, és éppen meleg is vagyok, hanem, hanem neki is ugyanúgy meg legyen ugyanaz a lehetősége, mint minden más gyereknek. Thank you very much. Uh, well, this was the end of my presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Judith. And um, that was um, fascinating. And, and I'm so glad you had the video and we were able to make it work mostly. But I note that there's also a uh, link in the chat in case you weren't able to view it or in case you'd like to sort of uh, see it again. Um, next, we have Alexander Kondakov from the University um, um, University College Dublin and uh, with speaking about defending the Russian state from queer theory. Thanks very much. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much for having me here and uh, 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 for organizing the conference uh, that uh, so far has been a real pleasure to attend. Uh, so uh, I, I guess in this uh, presentation there are two things going on that, uh, that I'm going to talk about. One is uh, how do you defend a state 
against uh, uh, queerness, right? And uh, uh, it is an analytic attempt that I'm doing how uh, uh, on an example of, of Russia and the Russian government's um, actions um, uh, uh, that result in a kind of erection of, of a defense mechanism uh, against uh, what they call gender ideology and, and queerness uh, in particular on the one hand. But on the other hand, it's also a uh, personal account of uh, events that has uh, happened to me in my life, in my academic career uh, in, in Russia. And uh, uh, I hope that it can serve at least uh, 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 of uh, kind of a little bit general in, in an, a little bit generalizable uh, way. I also have a presentation for you to share. Defending the Russian state from queer theory, it's definitely work in progress. So uh, don't judge it um, uh, too strictly. Uh, and uh, some uh, uh, ideas, I guess, I have uh, uh, defended already uh, previously, and and this uh, is something that is being developed further on. And I will uh, appreciate any comments you 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 would like to make in relation to it. So uh, yeah, the basic question is how one defends uh, a state from queer theory. Uh, I will try to. Uh, to present uh, my, my argument in, in three different domains or in three uh, actually fields where uh, my case in point, the, the Russian government defends uh, the state, right? So you, you basically, uh, if, if I recast an overall argument, you basically defend it in, in, uh, through uh, the law and policies, obviously, uh, and the production of knowledge, so uh, academia, and uh, the third field would be uh, the civil society. You, you, you also involve uh, that uh, force uh, on your side in order to uh, eventually do uh, the work uh, you, you think uh, you need to do. And uh, be before uh, I kind of go into details of those three uh, fields, I want to say that, um, in fact, the, uh, the, the task of defending the state from um, from gender and ideology and queerness uh, is uh, indeed a part of official uh, Russian government's strategy, right? And uh, uh, here's one example where this articulation uh, of this defense um, mm, of the necessity of such defense uh, is uh, uh, done straightforwardly. So it's a document, it's a national security strategy, a national security plan uh, that was adopted uh, in uh, 2015. And uh, in paragraph four, major threats to, to the state and society are, uh, in Russia are uh, listed, right? And it's, a, it's quite a long paragraph. There are many, many, many uh, sections. But uh, let me introduce to you just three first uh, sections where national security can be breached. What are those uh, threats? As you see from the slide, one is activities, and the first one is the activities of foreign intelligence. The second one is terrorism. And now the third one is where actually my mm, interest uh, comes in. It is uh, the activities of foreign, I quote, and international non-governmental organizations, financial and economic bodies, private persons who aim to shake the unity and territorial integrity of the Russian Federation, destabilize internal political and social situation by uh, inspiring color revolution and by destroying, and this is the important part, traditional Russian spiritual and moral values, right? So um, this is where uh, the idea of the necessity of, uh, of defense of, uh, of, of the state and society in Russia uh, from um, uh, uh, gay influence uh, enters into, uh, into official proclamation, into official uh, national uh, security strategy. Uh, if you uh, if you are wondering, the, uh, then the list continues, and uh, uh, let's say natural calamities, uh, climate change, uh, corruption, uh, international criminal organizations—they all uh, fade 
uh, somewhere into the background of these more important threats to to the uh, to the uh, integrity of of the Russian state, and uh, certainly uh, the uh, task of defending the state from uh, gender and queerness uh, is uh, something that can be achieved on 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 many different levels, and uh, there is. Uh, already quite a lot of literature on the international dimension of this work, uh, um, especially through reinterpretation of human rights um, and fundamental freedoms through a better understanding of traditional values of humankind. So traditional values do feature in uh, Russian government's uh, uh, international politics and policies, right? But I will focus on uh, the uh, domestic dimension of this work. And uh, at home, these uh, traditional values are uh, defined uh, much, much more straightforwardly than on the international arena. So uh, uh, at home in, in Russia, in, in domestic policies and politics, it has become unequivocally clear that um, traditional values are th those particular values which exclude, as the Supreme Court of Russia in these uh, quotes states, that exclude uh, uh, homosexual relations, bisexuality, and transgenderism, right? So they are not included uh, into uh, traditional values. So uh, this is how uh, the, the, the whole discourse, the idea of traditional values is uh, actually directly uh, related to uh, LGBT uh, politics. And um, mm, in order to protect uh, the uh, publics from uh, LGBT and uh, queerness and gender ideology more generally, uh, two uh, major legislation were uh, enacted in the 2010s. So the first one was um, the foreign agents law. Uh, it was enacted uh, in 2012 and it targeted nonprofit organizations uh, who uh, receive at least part of their funding from abroad, right? So officially, if they do so and uh, also engage in politics, then they can be subjected to this foreign agent law, which basically more or less um, paralyzes their uh, activities. It wasn't um, implemented for, for a long time after its adoption, but uh, already in 2014-15, the first organizations who suffered from its implementation, from its enactment, were uh, all the very few uh, LGBT organizations in Russia, right? They were the first ones to um, uh, be uh, included, or, or the attempt was made to, be, uh, to include them into the list of foreign agents, and uh, they chose uh, let's say, to um, shut their operations uh, or, or their uh, legal bodies uh, instead of being included into this register. Now, uh, this uh, law was uh, also amended last year, and now uh, not only organizations but individuals can become uh, foreign agents too. And the same requirements uh, apply. And the second law that is very important in this uh, regard is the law uh, banning uh, so-called propaganda of uh, homosexuality or propaganda of non-traditional sexual relationships. Uh, it has a long history of regional um, adoption, uh, as it was first adopted in uh, 2006 in Rezan, just a, a small region close to Moscow. But uh, now it's a federal level legislation. It's an administrative censorship law Right, that says that you cannot disseminate information about um, LGBT topics. And again, it kind of uh, creeped into, uh, into existence, not only because it was first adopted at the regional level, but also because first it wasn't really uh, applied uh, in, in the manner that it, uh, it is applied now with uh, hundreds and hundreds of cases um, 
uh, going through uh, courts. This law uh, targets uh, uh, directly uh, any expression of, of queerness, right? Except for those expressions that are negative. Uh, yet, uh, although we or, or I analyzed this situation for quite a while by then, uh, somehow back in 2013, I didn't know uh, how, how bad the situation actually was, right? And what was happening uh, really. For example, uh, in the same 2013, uh, what we were doing we, we, uh, in, in the Center for Independent Social Research, we organized a whole conference on queer and LGBT studies uh, across Russia. The law was adopted in summer that year and uh, in autumn we uh, welcomed people from all over uh, Russia uh, to present on this conference. And it was a successful event, I think. Uh, so uh, I guess we were quite clueless by back then what was actually going on uh, right under our nose. Uh, but uh, uh, I'm mentioning it not to, to uh, make fun of myself, but to say that actually it is uh, important that this pace of kind of creeping uh, uh, regulation of, of the public sphere through uh, enactment of those laws was not so easy to, uh, to, uh, to, to grasp uh, from the very beginning. It was a kind of sudden change. It was really uh, something that was uh, that was uh, happening step by step with small bites that that the government was uh, undertaking. Uh, back then, uh, um, the only thing that really happened was this um, uh, this blacklist that was published before the conference and included all our uh, keynote speakers and. Um, um, organizers of the conference, uh, uh, but uh, what what we thought about that blacklist back then was well, it's just a marginal, weird uh, kind of position expression uh, of of uh, an interesting and um, um, uh, powerless people who who can't really harm us, right? Well, uh, the same was true about this person who. Uh, actually is the author of uh, St. Petersburg uh, Gay Propaganda Law. Also a, 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 a kind of clown uh, who uh, was just out there um, talking uh, weird things about gender, uh, like in this quote, for example, that I will not read, but uh, th things like that, that, that uh, sounded bizarre and and uh, uh, could not be considered uh, serious. But uh, and yet uh, now, of course, uh, his laws are enacted and they uh, they work. Uh, he himself works as a member of parliament in Moscow, and, and his career is definitely on the rise. So, um, uh, in in my personal story, uh, uh, this guy almost shut down the university where I worked back back then. Uh, and uh, uh, definitely paralyzed for two years uh, the uh, operations of the European University uh, where I worked you know, because we couldn't uh, really teach uh, due to uh, his um, uh, complaints to the um, uh, general attorney's office. Uh, in fact, many more institutions that um, Mm, studied uh, gender and sexuality that uh, mm, uh, had uh, uh, LGBT and queer research in their uh, agenda existed uh, back then. And uh, uh, most of them uh, basically uh, either ceased to exist or are uh, paralyzed as the result of these um, legal innovations. Uh, in fact, uh, academia, mm, with these measures, uh, the, the, the laws and, and the general hostile policy towards uh, LGBT and queer research, uh, uh, and academia really transformed. And these marginal positions uh, that uh, we thought were marginal, uh, they actually 
uh, have become legitimized uh, through uh, through uh, through the whole situation and through through the law, uh, through these laws, but also through what uh, environment these laws uh, eventually created, and um, uh, even though uh, the laws did not directly deal with, uh, and, and they do not directly deal with uh, gender studies or sexuality uh, studies, they legitimize conservative voices in academia and make them, in fact, the only voices that uh, are currently heard. Uh, what what uh, I, I refer to these kinds of voices is uh, police science. And it's uh, one example, again, from my personal experience. So this article entitled The Gender Strategies of NGO Soft Power as a Tool of Remaking of the Cultural Code of the States and Society in Russia. It's, it doesn't make sense, probably, uh, the title of this article. But when, when you read it again and again, it does. In that particular discourse, the point is uh, here is that uh, here's one of the um, mm, uh, uh, tables yeah, that they published in that article, and this is what they charge the Center for Independent Social Research with, uh, the organization in St. Petersburg where I worked. They charge it with a list, if you don't read in Russian, I will tell you, with a list of um, publications. And all these publications are written by uh, yours truly. It's about same-sex marriage in Russia. It's about uh, it's it's the book uh, resulting from the conference. It's about pussy right. I wrote that article. It's a nice one actually. It's about uh, homosexuality and uh, public opinion. Uh, one of my first article, uh, human rights for um, gay and lesbian people in Russia. Uh, sexual citizenship. So uh, these are uh, texts that I wrote, and uh, they uh, ended up uh, as an evidence that I or the organization where I work uh, destroys Russian traditional values. So uh, this is about academia. I can give you more example um, of how it's done, and I won't. Uh, but uh, uh, definitely, you can uh, you can imagine the the level of this academic arguing of police science. The point here is that uh, in, they're not interested in producing research or evidence based knowledge. More generally, the police science is there to confirm the government's position, right? To confirm it and uh, to uh, just to prove it that the government is totally right. In this particular case, it is right. Uh, in defending the state and society mm -hmm. from mm, from mm, from queerness, right? There are other examples uh, now, and they are, by the way, in all camps of academia. So uh, there are more liberal institutions, and yet uh, there are those voices there too. Finally, the mm -hmm. final example that I'm making another attack on gender and queer. Uh, conversations comes from the so-called civil society uh, or uh, government organized actually uh, civil society. This is a case in point, the Committee for the Defense of National Interests. Uh, it's uh, a self-proclaimed um, civil society organization. And this organization uh, claims to consist of concerned citizens who uh, believe that um, there's something going on uh, in, uh, in Russia. There are people uh, working inside the country to to uh, to destroy uh, Russia's uh, traditional um, values, right? And uh, there is a um, a database of those people who who do so. And uh, as an example, here is uh, again yours truly in this database. Uh, I um, destroy uh, these um, traditional values uh, by being a deputy editor in chief of the Journal of Social Policy Studies. But there are more uh, people who do so. In fact, the list is uh, consists of hundreds of people, and uh, there are also organizations who, who do this kind of work more uh, systematically. So what they do is that they uh, serve 
um, foreign governments in order to destroy Russia through uh, shaking up its uh, traditional values, right? And there's a, a, a register for people as such. Uh, the roots and the memberships of these organizations are unclear. You will not, you will never find anything about it. More, moreover, their um, social media accounts are very obscure. Um, a lot of uh, followers on Instagram, but only one like for each post, right? So uh, it is a kind of suspicious organization that uh, I guess um, with more data can be proven that it's... Um, uh, it's just a, a kind of troll uh, organization created by by the government. Now, uh, when Twitter banned them, uh, this organization, uh, it was all over the news in Russia, right? The, the, the first channel, the, the governmental channel, all, all TV channels showed uh, uh, in news that uh, this, that the civil society suffers from uh, evil uh, Twitter policies. So uh, uh, I wanted to be short, so I'm, I'm kind of um, uh, going uh, to uh, my conclusions. And here I'm just, uh, I just highlight a few things. So first of all, uh, the defense system is complex, right? So it acts in different fields, law, policy, civil society, academia. There is no direct bond, but uh, um, these are... Uh, but but uh, uh, somehow it's the reinterpretation of human rights through this traditional values discourse. And the techniques are very interesting. The internet uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, techniques uh, of, of dissemination of information and power is combined with direct uh, re repression. That enacts basically self-censorship. I will stop here and I hope for uh, having a great discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Alexander. Um, everybody uh, who's out there, um, please feel free to start putting any questions you might have in the chat box um, and, and we can start collecting them um, to present to the speakers um, uh, you know, after the next presentation, which will be by Gina Gwenferi from the uh, University of Edinburgh. Uh, uh, Gina, are you there? Great, so welcome to my presentation, The Dungeon on the City on a Hill. Concerning the structure, I'll briefly highlight some facts about mass incarceration in the US today in order to underscore its scale. I'll introduce some key concepts, then I'll briefly look at some contrasting texts that show the kind of trans female narratives celebrated in the mainstream in the US and some of those less well known and marginalized. In terms of mass incarceration, I will assume that everybody is familiar with the USA's propensity to deal with particular transgressions by particular communities through the system of mass incarceration, a system that includes not only prison, but, only, but also financial penalties and fines. Here are some supporting facts. The USA accounts for 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prison population. There are more than a million African Americans in prison because black people are incarcerated at a rate of six times that of whites. The rebellion in the town of Ferguson uncovered how the local government was literally extorting the black population to such a degree that monies derived from these fines and fees were the second largest source of revenue. Because politicians have been reluctant to raise taxes on wealthy individuals or corporations, police are increasingly responsible for municipal revenue. Nearly a third of US states jail people for not paying off their debts, including court-related fees. When these fees are not paid, they create a legal odyssey from which it can be difficult, if not impossible, for ordinary people to emerge with their finances intact. What the system of mass incarceration highlights is that there are at least two Americas, one shaped by white middle class, stereotypically European identity, and another that threatens this ideal. The media and political class contribute to this delineation. We see this in the historic divergence of trans female identity in the US, including in terms of representation. On the left, we see a list of 20th century trans women whose biographies are regarded as forming a type of canon, 
and whose lives are viewed as pioneering. They are all white, middle aged and middle class, some based in the US, some in Europe. And this underpins how notion of, notions of womanhood and legitimacy are connected to white European identity. In the words of Emily Skidmore's research on the good transsexual, they are based on domesticity, respectability and heterosexuality, with the white women cast as chaste, moral and refined. Yet research by scholars such as Riley Snorton highlights how during the, period, the same period of these 20th century pioneers, there were also African-American trans women who were simply ignored by mainstream media as well as persecuted selectively by white-centered law enforcement agencies, including via the life-destroying impact of penalties and fines, not suffered by their white counterparts. For example, and I quote from the research by Snorton uh, on Carlett Brown and Ava Betty Brown, Brown was virtually destitute in Boston, unable to raise $5 for bail when imprisoned for wearing female garb in public. Ava Betty Brown was arrested while standing on the corner of Oakley and Madison, waiting for her boyfriend. Though minding her own business, Brown was arrested for wearing women's clothes. She was charged with female impersonation. From this divergence, we enter the 21st century with a new paradigm of trans representations, ostensibly predicated upon ideas of diversity, tolerance, and inclusiveness. This, in fact, is a reform reformation of existing notions of identity in which the essential ideology of white middle-class norms remains in place. Lisa Duggan, analysis, uh, Lisa Duggan analyzes this new neoliberal paradigm with her conception of homonormativity. And I quote, an LGBT politics, homonormativity is an LGBT politics that does not contest dominant heteronormative assumptions and institutions, but upholds and sustains them. It involves primarily focusing on two issues, gay access to marriage and the military. Adapting this analysis is Jasbir Puar, who conceives of homo-nationalism and says the calls it the production of gay and queer bodies as is crucial to the deployment of nationalism, providing ammunition to reinforce national projects or nationalist projects as well. A typical homo-normative footprint is produced by trans woman of color, Janet Mock. Mock described by the Guardian journalist Simon Hutterson as the most famous trans activist in the world, has a considerable media platform and receives considerable exposure, exposure in, the, in the talk show circuit, promoting her various media-based projects while sharing her story as a trans woman of color who has overcome childhood poverty. Mock, in fact, sees her personal story as a radical act. And I quote, I believe that telling our stories first to ourselves, then to one another and to the world is a revolutionary act. Yet her memoirs typify the kind of stylized lifestyle narrative that has overtones of a self-help book. And I quote from the blurb, you will be changed by this book by Melissa Harris Perry or by People magazine. Mock's journey of self-discovery is not all that different from yours or mine a lesson in acceptance that I hope all kinds of readers will take away from this powerful book. And finally, fi sorry, finally from the Daily Telegraph, a call to arms for other women to embrace the beauty inside them, whatever their circumstances. On the function of personal narrative within neoliberal society, Sujatha Fernandez highlights its ideological function in consolidating the social order. And I quote, Curated personal stories shift the focus away from structurally defined axes of oppression and help to diffuse the confrontational politics of social movements. This claim of invisible and silenced people gaining a voice through stories is itself a rhetorical construction. Those who are able to make their personal experiences legible to the mainstream through drawing on dominant narratives and devices are given a platform while other voices are silenced. The ideological role of curative storytelling is exemplified by the two memoirs produced by Janet Mock. Oh, there we go. 
If we look at redefining realness, for example, published 2014, we see that the percentage of pages with structural criticism of issues such as mass incarceration is at 0%, while the follow-up memoir published in 2018 on her life in her 20s, surpassing certainty, has two pages from 331, or 0.6% of, of the book. Mock typically avoids discussing politics in either her memoirs or talk show circuit. However, in one particular talk show interview, ostensibly intended for Mock to promote her documentary about trans lives, Mock is asked about the political situation in the US in relation to the 2016 presidential election won by Trump. Mock's response is insightful in revealing her relatively moderate centrist views concerning social and economic policy. And I quote, Hillary Clinton's campaign was running on this sense of trying to widen that coalition and say that we're going to center and prioritize folk who have not been centered and prioritized for so long in our, in our politics. Mock's, uh, Mock's identification with the political agenda of Hillary Clinton parallels that of another mainstream trans activist, Sarah McBride, former spokesperson for the Human Rights Campaign and now Senator for Delaware, for the Democrat Party. Sarah McBride also commented on the results of the 2016 election, saying, Throughout the election, Hillary Clinton had run the most trans-inclusive campaign in history. She had endorsed all of the major policy goals of the trans community. This is an insightful comment with its assumption that there is only a single trans community with a single agenda of policy goals. Later in the biography, we, we learn that these types of policy goals are homonormative and involve marriage equality and, for example, trans people in the military. These vaguely left of center centrist responses highlight how Mark and McBride align with neoliberal politi political solutions that focus on inclusivity rather than inequality and redistribution, and accordingly as institutional and structural reforms. A critique of Clinton's politics by Naomi Klein highlights its limitations in changing much in the lives of the more vulnerable and disempowered members of society. And I quote from Klein, Clinton's brand of identity politics does not challenge the system that produced and entrenched these inequalities, but seeks only to make that system more inclusive. So yes to marriage equality and abortion access and transgender bathrooms, but forget about the right to housing, the right to a wage that supports a family. Clinton resisted the calls for a $15 minimum wage. In addition to this critique by Klein, it is worth noting Clinton's commitment to the policy of mass incarceration. In the 1990s, Clinton famously made the speech that dehumanized African-American people, and I quote, we need to take these people on. They are often connected to big drug cartels. They are not just gangs of kids anymore. They are often the kinds of kids that are called super predators, no conscience, no empathy. We can talk about why they ended up that way, but first we have to bring them to heal. In contrast to Mock and McBride, trans woman of color Jamie Barut rejects the political and cultural institutions of the USA, including its publishing industry, which Barut accuses of ideological gatekeeping. And I quote from Barut, One moment, there we go. The systemic racism that means nine out of 10 editors in the publishing world are white. They make their demands for bland, neoliberal, faux universal narratives of cis hetero people of color life. On her experience of trying to publish her first novel, Otros Vales, she says, in 2015, Topside Press emailed wanting to publish it, but when confronted with their racist practices and a demand for them to fundamentally change, they lost interest. One of Barut's biggest targets in both her creative writing and essays is the US system of mass incarceration. Let's just move. Here we go. In the short story, Valeria, by Barut, about the USA's prison industrial complex, we see one particular passage 
on plea bargains, penalties, and police violence, which is particularly resonant of contemporary issues. And I quote, the county was locking up people it knew couldn't possibly come up with $500 or $5,000 for bail over nothing infractions. But if the prosecutor's office said they could prove that this poor kid, who has no means to cobble together a defense and convince a jury otherwise, assaulted a dozen brave officers while in handcuffs with a knee planted in the back of his neck, the judge would call the kid an animal. It is by highlighting the militaristic nature of the police that we see a connection too between the concept, concepts of homonormativity and homonationalism, with the latter the way that mass incarceration appears as an occupation involving, in Barut's words, concentration camp conditions of a settler colonial administration. A similar focus on mass incarceration, front and center, is evident in the documentary Free CC about CC MacDonald. MacDonald's narrative in the documentary is mainly focused. Oh, sorry, let me just give you some backstory. MacDonald was originally sentenced and then imprisoned for two years for manslaughter after suffering an attack by white supremacists, one of whom MacDonald killed in self defense during the assault. McDonald's narrative in the documentary is mainly focused on addressing the oppressions of the prison industrial complex, with McDonald's structural abolitionist position aligning with historians such as Angela Davis, Michelle Alexander, and Kianga Yamata Taylor. McDonald says, racism lives within the prison industrial complex, and in order to end that, to end racism, we'd have to abolish all those powerful institutions that allow that energy to navigate through our lives. One moment. Okay. Ideologically, we see a discourse that sees people as either deserving winners or losers in a variety of manifestations. For example, compare the text by Sarah McBride against that of C.C. MacDonald. In McBride's memoir, we see a focus on self-reliance and self-responsibility, and I quote, I know I personally hate to ask for help, in part because I want to prove to society that I can be strong and independent. Contrast this with MacDonald, whose life, despite being um, of a very similar age to McBride, having a very different experience, um, homeless by 14, and incarcerated after an attack by white supremacists in her early 20s. McDonald says, I'm still struggling. I have bills. I got to pay rent, but I'm here for my community and I'm going to do what I can. If I have it, I will give it to you. Isn't that what community is about? Similarly, if we look at the difference between Janet Mox. Um, no narrative focus and that of Barut, we see the difference between individualism and the collective. With Mock, for example, and I quote, I didn't want to see work as just a competition, but I figured besting my co-workers output would help me shine. I was hungry, ambitious, and eager. Whereas with Barut, the focus is never on her personal life. We know nothing about her. Instead, it is about uni unionization and collective organizing. She says, what's wrong with success? Well, that's the thing. Any success that is achieved at the expense of other people's lives, that's no success at all. What, oh, um, overall, Barut's rejection, like McDonald's, of current ideological forms of the US are shared with other grassroots organizations outside of the mainstream. Against Equality describes itself as a small, all-volunteer, anti-capitalist collective based in North America that critiques the holy trinity of mainstream gay and lesbian politics, gay marriage, gays in the military, and hate crime legislation. In other words, the kind of policies associated with homonormativity. On abolitionist trans politics, meanwhile, um, Eric Stanley and Nat Smith say that prison abolition, and I quote, must be one of the centers of trans and queer liberation struggles. Starting with abolition, we open questions often disappeared by both mainstream LGBT and anti-prison movements. What these organizations reveal is the way trans activism, like trans representation, is divided along class and proximity to the white-centered middle-class ideals encapsulated by homonormativity in a neoliberal society. 
this society is vastly unequal, with mass incarceration and militarized policing ruining millions of lives, including those of many trans people. Mass incarceration and its abolition in this sense becomes a touchstone issue, and its occlusion in mainstream narratives by celebrity trans voices highlights the limits of these voices and the agendas they represent in helping particular economically disadvantaged trans communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gina. What I'd like to do for this, we have a bunch of questions in the chat, and but I'm going to shamelessly uh, just abuse my privilege as chair to maybe ask the first question um, from this. And it's, it's a question I guess I could pose to all of the panelists, which is why I wanted to start with it. And then, then there's a series of questions for individual panelists. Um, so I'll ask my question, and then maybe I'll start with one other question for each of the panelists. And so they can respond in turn, and then we'll collect some more questions if, if that's okay. Um, with the panelists. Um, I don't know what you're going to do if it's not, I guess, uh, <laughs> speak up. Um, one of the things that was that kind of so interesting about this panel is, is it's about authoritarianisms. And we had here examples of scholarship from Hungary, from Russia, and, and dealing with the United States. Um, as well. And there's something, you know, we're, we're all, you know, I think at this point, we're familiar with, say, the homo, the homo national critique about things. And as Debesh was talking about yesterday, um, about the about the needing to sort of focus more on the national, right, than the homo. And I think these, these presentations today are excellent um, examples of, of doing that from different national um, kinds of contexts. At the same time, though, because it really does seem like, particularly in the past, um, the past decade, the five years to ten years ago, there's the the politics of this kind of anti-genderism, right? Have have been quite international um, as far as they relate to far right regimes, right? So from Hungary um, to the to the really the the, the transphobia in the UK that's so virulent. Um, and that is now I see like the same exact playbooks, the same move in the media, the same kind of far right. It's now it's now headed to the U.S. Right? Not that not that it was some kind of like you know trans utopia there before, obviously, as Gina pointed out, but kind of the same similar moves and 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 Brazil in the same way. So I'm wondering if the panelists, if you could speak to the ways in which, though you know, of course, especially as Alexander and and Judith talked about there's a very much a discourse of the kind of save the nation from the queers, right? Um, um, but the ways in which this is itself a kind of internationalist movement, right? And what do, you know, what do those have, you know, can speak to this moment from that? Um, so I want to start with um, a question from um, Alexander Alexandra Novitskaya, um, who asks, with the with the pandemic initiated move of academic events to the online medium, have there been more opportunities for Russia phone uh, queer and gender studies to evade censorship? Um, and for um, Judith um, from Marchen, um, as you use the term genderphobia. What is its relationship to transphobia and homophobia? Would you say that trans rights are now somehow particularly singled out in discussions on LGBTQ in Hungary? Um, and a question for, I thought I saw a question for Gina in here. There's half a question for Gina in here. <laughs> Someone's working on it um, so far. Um, how about we just how about we just start there and we'll collect some more questions um, and 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 you can all respond to them in turn. We'll start um, with Judith, if that's okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for the question. I I would like to um, I believe that genderphobia is a is a is a wider um, term uh, than transphobia and homophobia. So this is like, uh, um, well, transphobia and homophobia are like, uh, you know, subsections of genderphobia. And this all related to this uh, wider gender belief um, system about, you know, this uh, binary, um, uh, well, um, 
the the binary character of of genders and you know like these uh, very um, um, well specific and uh, different pasts of uh, men and women in society. So I would say the gender phobia is uh, it can be relevant for everyone. I mean it's not a trans specific uh, issue. And of course I mean I know this evergreen. Uh, um, discussions about phobia being, you know, I mean, if, if you use phobia, then uh, as it was um, well invented uh, in the early 1970s in the context of homophobia, that it's supposed to refer to some sort of individual level um, blame, but it's, it is in, 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 in my understanding, it is not. I mean, in gender phobia, of course, I mean, we have to focus on the social embeddedness of this, uh, uh, well, gender phobic issues. Uh, so um, uh, I, th I think uh, this, this can be useful uh, when discussing um, any kind of, uh, uh, well, uh, strategic uh, use of uh, gender related, uh, um, well, um, stereo stereotypes and uh, and uh, specific attitudes and uh, uh, re uh, regarding the um, the second uh, half of the question or the second question whether uh, in Hungary now uh, um, well trans rights are somehow particularly singled out. Um, yes, uh, uh, they are, which is quite interesting, actually, because uh, it was um, Hungary. Uh, uh, it was Hungary. Hungary was the the um, uh, the country, the first country in the world, which actually had on the uh, on on the on the national level introduced. Uh, um, the protection of uh, a gender identity uh, uh, in an anti-discrimination context. So this was in the early 2000s, in 2003. And uh, so, I mean, I guess this is a kind of, um, uh, well, um, well, not a very happy story that uh, uh, between 2003 and 2020, we had uh, such, uh, well, um, Mm, uh, such developments and these are not positive developments and uh, I would say that this can, uh, war you know, I mean, this can be a warning sign for everyone that, uh, uh, you know, there is no such linear uh, you know, positive development that, you know, things will will get better and better and then you can't lose anything. So you, we have to be aware of this, I guess, that, uh, I mean, all those rights are, they, they can be taken away. Uh, very quickly, as we can see, in, especially in the pandemic context, unfortunately. Okay. Thank you, Judith. Uh, Alexander? Yeah, thank you very much for for the question, Lauren. And uh, I, th th there's a lot going on in, in nationalist, transnationalist uh, kind of dimension of this whole uh, conversation. Definitely, Russian government wants to play a very important role on the international arena with this uh, by, by advancing this traditional values discourse and uh, kind of uh, uh, building it, its its position in the world on it, right? So uh, coming back to this, um, let's say, uh, Cold War bipolar world that they are talking about sometimes on the Russian TV through... Uh, 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 opposing to uh, homonationalism uh, by heteronationalism on the international arena, right? And, uh, and, and there are even studies already that, that actually trace how uh, exactly uh, the government and different uh, private and, and uh, public institutions uh, in, uh, from Russia try to construct a kind of network of conservative uh, uh, political organizations together with uh, some United States organizations, especially from um, more sort of religious uh, background and, and, and influence the world agenda uh, by, uh, by advancing their 
conservative cause, right? Together. So R Russian money, uh, uh, evangelicals, uh, uh, ideology of traditional values, uh, a mixture of, of all that, and uh, the world domination is uh, achieved, basically. And I, I think it is an, an interesting an interesting line of inquiry that, that uh, definitely worth looking at, and especially uh, uh, not only for con con concrete specific things that are going on, but also to advance our theoretical understanding of, of uh, what that homonationalism is. Is it there, or, or, or maybe we can complicate it with, the, uh, with these perspectives from, from uh, other uh, contexts and, and uncover some new things uh, in, in relation to it. I, I, I would be eager to, to, to do something like that. Well, my work is right now more focused on what's, what's going on uh, kind of domestically uh, uh, rather than uh, internationally, but uh, indeed there's a, there's a lot uh, of it uh, are for, um, for international consumption. And, and it is uh, an important part of this whole uh, um, politics uh, of, of the Russian government, I guess. And as uh, for, uh, for um, COVID and its impact, uh, and, the, and the question from uh, Alexandra, uh, n nice to see you here too. Uh, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, uh, it's a technology that can be used in many different ways. And I, I again, uh, base my argument, for example, in my own uh, experience. So I, I have participated in some events uh, in uh, Russia, speaking about queer stuff uh, there. And uh, the intention of some of those events was to, to publish that online after the uh, Zoom kind of thing happened, right? And those, uh, those uh, events uh, were not published eventually. Some of them were, some of them were not. So uh, there is, uh, of course, a lot of opportunity that uh, uh, technology opens up, but also uh, publication, online publication, uh, is highly regulated in, in, in Russia. So, so uh, those some organizations are cautious about that. And there is also self-censorship involved. So yeah, there are opportunities, but also there are obstacles uh, that are posed um, by, um, by the uh, Zoomification of, of our life currently, right? And uh, it's not uh, so obvious. What's what's happening? I guess. Thanks. Thanks, um, Gina. Did you want to respond to my first question or anything? Yeah, else? I would like to uh, just briefly because I don't have that much information because it's quite murky. But on internationalist movements, because I'm very aware of gender critical feminism and it's not monolithic, but I'm aware of how you can have these temporary coalitions forming. Um, a good example is the Heritage Foundation in the US, which is anti-abortion, for example, and they sponsored some gender critical feminists to come over from Britain, um, Julia Long and Parker Posey, to basically harass Sarah McBride, um, kind of doorstep her and, and dead name her at, at her office. And I'm aware that there's, there's some kind of discomfort even going on within gender critical feminism. Julie Bindle has has expressed her discomfort with this kind of coalition building with extreme right-wing misogynistic organizations. Whereas others, I watched Megan Murphy, who's a gender critical feminist talking about, she will, she's willing to make coalitions with whoever's willing to make coalitions with her in order to stop this transgender menace or movement. So it's not uniform, but you definitely have within gender critical feminism, some who, who see coalition building with, a, well, uh, what you would perceive to be the common enemy in, in order to kind of defeat transgender identity. And that's definitely happening between the USA and between, and between Britain. And I don't know if it spreads further to places like Hungary as well. Um, and that's something that I think would be very interesting to research. 
Thanks very much. And, and also just the, the sense of insofar as it's an international movement, the, the ways in which it travels and, and, you know, that may not necessarily go in the same kinds of power relationships and that that we would expect to see in international relations would be an interesting research topic for somebody who's got more time than me, but <laughs> it's on a, it's on, it's on a list. Um, um, one of the things that I thought was, was particularly fascinating about this panel also in the way that it was set up is it's about authoritarianisms and um, particularly with the range of countries that we're dealing with here. And this, this speaks to some of the questions here that, that I'm glad that the United States was cons considered this because I think it raises really provocative questions for our theorizing of things like, you know, we talk about queer liberalism all the time and, and we're um, as a kind of counterpoint to the ways in which we understood there to be a sort of conservatism um, of a lot of these movement, movements um, because they tend to be opposed to feminism and um, transgender and queer issues at the same time. But to think about the ways in which, say, let's, let us say regime type of a state, and I'm not really sounding like my, my, my political science training is really coming through here, um, a regime type to be the most kind of kind of point, like so that necessarily that the kinds of um, we would be dealing with like queer liberalism right in the United States whatsoever, but to really think about the the ways in which it's a kind of authoritarianism, liberalism for some and authoritarianism for others, right? That's that's embedded in these politics here. And I think so that's that is um um a part of what I take um there to be uh, a question from YouTube from from Leah Owens. Um who, um, first of all, of course, says Gina's presentation was fantastic, as were they all, and that she thinks identifying this um, kind of internal oppression is incredibly value. And um, uh, Leah Owens writes, I'd be interested in picking up the links between the two forces you identify, a, racial, a, a racialized class anti-trans oppression and the United States, but also this kind of broader gender ideology, transphobia that targets trans people as an overall category what kinds of interactions you see between these two and what as scholars and queers, white and people of color like is the best way to resist these two forces without losing sight of either and centering multiply marginalized queer people. So just, just a small question. That's <laughs> a great question. A small question. Um, and um, we have a couple more questions as well for um, Alexander. Um, some of them, you know, again, picking up on some of this kind of foreign questions. So a question, um, from, from Lukash, is the law banning foreign capital not impacting conservative organizations as well? Have only LGBTQ organizations been forced to close down because of the law? Um, there was another question earlier for Alexander um, about what are the implications for NGOs who are labeled as foreign agents? And also a question for Alexander that I got to scroll up for, um, but a question about what, what exactly counts as traditional values, right, in Russia as a kind of multiple, um, you know, multicultural um, place. I'm sorry, scrolling's not working to get the exact wording here, but traditional for whom as a kind of multi-ethnic, multi-confessional, multicultural state. Um, and then if traditional means Russian Orthodox Church, what does that mean for everybody else? Um, and then there was one, uh, there was another question for Judith and um, it's from Sonia. And Sonia, it, it was kind of a long question. So Sonia, I wonder if you would be willing to um, ask yourself or not, if that's okay. Sure, happy to. I, it just was really um, in part commentary on, on sort of the power of hearing the narratives of, of the queer families, the, the rainbow families, um, but also just to hear maybe perhaps a little more from you about um, what kinds of opportunities for counter narratives do you see um, taking place currently, um, either on the part of families or institutions in, in Hungary? So just a fairly broad question, but um, I invite any thoughts to that end. Okay, can, so when we start, I just, I wanted to, um, I, I guess kind of in my question, I sort of summarize a bit of from uh, Mars's question as well, but this, but, but so I'm, cause I'm going to, I'm going to start by asking, we'll kind of go in reverse order as it were. So if, if I can start with Gina this time, 
Um, in the, so in the U.S., the illusion of freedom holds people back from realizing that the U.S. government is, is authoritarian and neoliberal, which causes inequalities within the U.S. society, particularly in Black and LGBTQ communities. How can we work toward breaking this, this illusion? So that's from Mars. All right. Thanks, Gina. G Gina, if you want to start. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's the $64,000 question because, I mean, if you go on various left-wing website, news websites like Navarra, um, like the Young Turks, Anna Kasparian talking about the difficulty within leftist circles to have unity because of, of the amount of tensions within them. Um, so in terms of, yeah, sorry, in terms of, um, sorry, can you repeat the, the, the question again, please? Just the last question. Yeah. Um, in the U.S., the illusion of freedom holds people back from realizing that the U.S. government is authoritarian and neoliberal, which causes inequalities within the U.S. society, particularly in Black and LGBT communities. So we have, no. we have, we have a kind of statement of causality there. Um, but how can we break, how can we work toward breaking this illusion and working on the problems it has caused? Yeah, so, and I think coalition building is 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 the, the thing at the moment that is even being discussed on the left. How can we do this? Um, what is the left? What is the working class even? I mean, there are really huge questions that are being asked in Britain and in the US in terms of how do we even categorize society? Like, do the do those young people who have just left university and, and, and they go straight into like low paid jobs, are they working, the new working class, are the former working class now the, the new kind of different class? So <clears throat> I think society is in such flux because of capitalism at the moment that it's, I think that the it's just one thing by itself on the left to understand how, how you can campaign, campaign in this coalitional type of politics. Um, it's almost like we're in this new paradigm now where we have to understand and appreciate racism in a way where it could be ignored before. And you still get these um, social commentators and theorists, theorists like Slavoj Žižek who are extremely disparaging about um, tra transgender rights, um, about racism as a particularly important thing for, for Žižek. It's all about class. And these other things are kind of like lifestyle issues. So there's like a, a generational gap that within, for example, leftist uh, social movements, um, which is which is creates a huge gap. Um, and <clears throat> being able to bridge these, I don't know, even know if it is possible in terms of the generation gap, but it's about understanding that <clears throat> politics on the left has to be coalitional if it's going to address the the huge the, the growing inequality that is happening with the neoliberal society and and i don't think anybody has particularly good answers i think people are still I, white people still need to um understand the severity of racism and and its importance as a as a meta narrative in itself <clears throat> so i think we're going through a paradigm now where <clears throat> it's there are generational gaps and <clears throat> spaces on the left certainly <clears throat> they need to yeah, they, they, there needs to be constant education and awareness raising in order to in order to kind of move on and and have some kind of progressive movements. I'm sorry, I don't know if that answers your question. Well, it's it's a it's a huge question, and and we don't have a, a ton of time left. We're we're going over already a little bit. So so I think I think we we might have to kind of leave, leave the question and then for us all to. <coughs> continue this week some more as well. Okay. Um, uh, Alexander? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, um, thanks for all your question and they're absolutely fair. And uh, uh, the thing is that I, I think uh, we have to understand that um, there is no definition of what the law is about, what the traditional values are about, right? There is, uh, it, it's just a kind of meme that is put out there and can be interpreted uh, contextually. And of course, no conservative organizations will suffer from the foreign agents law uh, simply because even if they uh, logically may be uh, uh, kind of targeted by this law, they will not be because the law is not created for them. The law is created to uh, advance a particular political uh, agenda, right? It is against LGBT organizations and other organizations that are uh, uh, 
um, kind of uh, counter government that do uh, that criticize the government. Right, so so it's about that, and traditional values is, is is the same the same thing. They don't have a very specific content like oh oh they are uh, orthodox church values or, or these or that values. They can be interpreted contextually in whatever way uh, it is currently desirable or uh, or instrumental in order to to advance a larger goal. And the goal is to uh, see. Um, uh, Russia, you know, competing on the international arena and being the power once again, or something like that. Yeah, we don't know what exactly is the goal, but um, something into in, into more or less that direction. And actually, I think it is important because uh, because Russian uh, government and pe- people who create all that they are uh, really professionalized in in doing things like that. They they're they're good at, at creating memes and and uh, at, at manipulating information in a way uh, that uh, really things work, you know, <laughs> and and uh, uh, things are being done. We we, we uh, associate now, for example, right? We now associate Russia with um, religion and and very very traditional, uh, I don't know, uh, views of, of of religious orthodoxy and things like that. Whereas it's the country that has been for for a century uh, atheistic, you know, really. Uh, Against uh, religion for a long time, and where people don't don't know uh, any religious texts in, in general, right? But but we think no, uh, the thing is the opposite. Or we think that uh, President Putin is so strong, and he's a strong man. He he, uh, you know, uh, very decisive and, and things. Whereas he's just a short guy who is relatively, you know. Uh, uneducated with uh, uh, some kind of strange set of skills that is not very helpful in politics, but but things work because they work otherwise. They work in in a different way, and this is the important thing that uh, I, I think that is uh, is well very interesting to uh, to kind of study uh, further because it's the 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 clue to to. To how really power works currently, to how uh, things um, are organized in in societies with these uh, uh, technologies uh, at stake. So uh, the point being that it's not about interpreting uh, concrete memes or pieces of information. It's about understanding that they can be contextually uh, uh, assembled in in a variety of different ways, and they will work. And this is their uh, power of those things. I think this is what I wanted to uh, to say. Yeah, maybe I missed a couple of questions, but if we understand things in that uh, way, I answered all of them. Thanks so much. Um, Judith, I'm going to let you have the uh, last word. Um, from- oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, actually, I think it's very important to focus on the, you know, possibilities for resistance. So in this way, I mean, I guess this would be very important to to take home uh, that this is important. Um, unfortunately, it's I, I, I can't really tell you, you know, wonderful success stories, though. I mean, I, um, well, uh, with Marcin and Haka, and we were discussing it, whether I should show this video or not, uh, but I decided that the end to to share it with you because actually this I mean by um, many actors of the LGBTIQ community it was seen you know production of this video as a kind of um, um, success story in um, in creating uh, LGBTQ visibility and also I mean uh, there are some specific uh, issues related to this like uh, in Hungary. Um, uh, uh, there is still um, uh, a lot of, uh, uh, well, uh, there are a lot of options for internal adoption, which means like in some countries, you you you, you can go for only international adoption because you don't have uh, uh, children who are available for adoption. In Hungary, um, uh, actually, uh, there are quite a lot of uh, uh, children who could be adopted, but who are not adopted, and they are mainly Roma children, like non-white children, we should 
uh, we can put it this way as well. And these children are usually not the most preferred category by the uh, married heterosexual middle class, uh, you know, um, would be adoptive parents. And uh, therefore they are left there after the first round of choice uh, for um, uh, individual um, uh, adoptive uh, uh, parents. And, uh, and most of those, uh, uh, I mean, among those, they were, you know, very often um, gays and lesbians. And now this is, you know, with the uh, this ban on adoption, this is what, you know, was uh, also destroyed. So I think I th thought that this is uh, well, also important to be aware of. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, when we are talking about uh, possibilities for resistance in the context of Hungary, and I guess also in Pol I mean, in, in the Polish context, uh, at the European level, I mean, LGBT issues can be constructed not only as an equality issue uh, or not only equality as e equality issues, but also as rule of law issues. And, uh, and you know, I mean, these countries, or I, I should talk about my own country, I mean, this uh, systematic erosion of, uh, you know, checks and balances, it's... Uh, it, we should recognize this uh, as um, as such, you know, like LGBTQ uh, IQ issues are not just uh, for LGBTIQ people, but uh, they are, of course, I mean, uh, they are, um, they can show, uh, they are the lachmus test, as Igor Kohn famously, uh, you know, uh, uh, stated about uh, sexual minority rights, but this is not just sexual minorities, of course. So we have to uh, be aware of this, and I guess uh, um, uh, this is uh, also a, a way to resist uh, uh, and, and of course, I mean, there are so many others, but, uh, and hopefully we will invent more, but I mean, um, I'm not uh, uh, able to tell you too many um, uh, more, you know, pieces of good news, at least not from my country at this moment. Thank you. Well, actually, to have this conference, this is good news. I mean, we should think about that. I mean, this is great. Thank you. Well, that's that's one good note to end on, at, at least. Well, I want to thank um, all of the speakers so very, very much. Maybe everybody who's here can join me in a little virtual round of applause um, for them. Great, um, great job. It was fascinating to be here. Thank you, um, Judith and Gina and Alexander, so very much. Thank you all for coming. And thank you, Marchan and Hakan, again, for organizing. All right. Thank you all so very, very much. And have a great evening.